podcast. <laughs> so I got an idea for today's show. Today's show is kind of like the facts of life for audiophile. And one of the things that I don't think is discussed enough is what about upgrades? And, you know, at first it seems like a pretty simple subject, but when you really get into it, there's a lot going on. So Herb and I are going to talk about our personal experiences in doing upgrades because I think the fundamental question here is, and I think you agree, is uh, what is the expectation for an upgrade? What are you trying to get? Or the inspiration. Or even the inspiration. I like that even better. Right. Right. So what, it, what is it all about? What do you want when you do the upgrade? When you spend your money, what do you want for your upgrade? I think that, what were you saying before about... What do you need, really? What, I mean, I had a friend who, who asked me, you know, should I make this upgrade? And mm -hmm. he had had this component for five years. And right. I said, but you've had it for five years. You know it. You love it, right? Yeah. What was it that you wish you had that you weren't getting? Right. And the sounds answer like was... A, sounds like a marriage or something, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's going that way. But what about upgrades? I mean, today... The most common thing people ask me, like in emails or wherever, mm -hmm. is, Herb, should I upgrade from this to this? Right. And it's really strange. One of the things I want to make really, really clear to anybody involved in this, even if you've been doing it a while, try not to find a speaker to suit your amp. <laughs> try to find a speaker that suits your room. I mean, what and then the work backwards and them. work backwards. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking for an upgrade, if you found a speaker that and it doesn't have to be the world's greatest speaker, it doesn't have to be the class A plus or well reviewed or anything. It's the speaker that just locks into your room and you're not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had these experiences lately. Actually, I'm having them with the temperature, but sounds the same way. The other day I was outside working in the garden and all of a sudden I said, wait a minute. The whole day just went by, and I never once thought about the temperature. Mm -hmm. And I have those days when I'm listening to music here, and half a day will go by, and I go, oh, my God, I wasn't thinking about hi-fi. Because I have to have days where I go, no hi-fi. We are not thinking about audio today at all. And strangely, when the speaker is right, I find myself having more of those days. But when I want to upgrade, when I want something for that speaker, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, just for a logical example, I have the LS35A, as everybody knows. They're really happy with a 300B, four, five, six, eight watts, but they also sound amazing with the 300 watt uh, Parasound. Parasound A21 Plus. And it's like, which do I want? Mm -hmm. And if you said, okay, Herb, now cost is no object. What would you do? What would you want? I'd have to say, you know, what am I missing with those two amps? And it would be a third sound. Mm. Not the A21, not the 300B. And it might mean I go for something like a push-pull triode amp with more muscle. Okay. Just to see, you know like push-pull 845s or something, just to see, try to get the best of both worlds in one amp. That would be my logic for an upgrade. Hmm. But emotionally, I would probably be looking for, because the 300B gives me a little more, I feel an emotional connection. Hmm. I might have to try some other people's amps, like borrow them from Steve or something, and see which one makes me not think about high five. Hmm. That would be the upgrade I'm always looking for. So that's yeah, that's another way of looking at what what do you want when you do this upgrade? Is the is the upgrade that makes you not think about upgrades? Maybe. Right. <laughs> yeah. No. Exactly. That's that was the point I'm trying to make. Thank you. Yeah. Is that that's the ultimate upgrade, or at least that's the direction? You right. know, you're on a road. You know, you're always. I mean, yeah. you know. if I had a big room, I'd have giant speakers. There's mm -hmm. no question. Right. You know. But I want to talk about a little bit about my first big upgrade, and that is when I moved up. I had a Thorin's TD160 turntable. This is in the late 70s, and I got a Lin LP12. And the thing was, 
that what and the Lynn is a belt drive turntable. The Thorns is a belt drive turntable. I mean, the Thorns is a really good turntable, but what did I get when I did it? And the answer is, even before the music started playing, when I just put the stylus in the groove, it was amazing to me right away. And I wasn't even thinking that this was going to happen, is how much quieter the record was even before the music started. It was like, is, it was one of those, is it on? <laughs> is it actually? Yeah, it was, but it was so much quieter than I had been used to up to that point. It was really shocking. And then when the music started to play, the music just had more, uh, <laughs> it was more alive. It was more, it was less like a recording to, oh man, I hate that cliche, but it was less like a recording. It, it had more life to it. Maybe that's what I'm searching for. There was just more life to the music where before it felt kind of canned and smaller and now it was just like released more was coming out of the groove and i was really excited because again i didn't know what to, at that point i didn't know what to expect and you're going from a good belt, and drive, a good belt drive to a either. better belt drive right at that exact same time as you were doing that and we didn't even know each other then right. i was going don't laugh i had a Kenwood KD500 direct drive mm -hmm. and a Denon DP3000 direct drive and somebody convinced me to buy an LP12 oh. and I bought a used one uh -huh. and okay that was the early 80s and now it's 2023 mm -hmm. I'm, it's still the quietest turntable I've heard <laughs> I mean, I'm shocked. I go around with my stethoscope right. and I listen to all these turntables and the Lynn wins every time. And mine's an old rickety, you know, mine's an old Model A Ford one. You know, it's not a fancy new one. So when you say the quietest, in what sense are you talking about quiet? With the stethoscope. The, okay, with the uh, yeah, stethoscope. and it, they're, they're the same. There's, I mean, there's a difference in the way, you know, like you said, when you put... I used to think I could tell what the thing was going to sound like just by the way it hit right. the groove. I didn't even need the record part, right. the music part. But all that thing, the audio files, oh, it's got all this little detail in the back spaces and everything. Quiet turntables show you little things that you don't hear with noisier ones. And the noise, for at least from those direct drives, or even any turntable, it's not just direct drive. I mean, a quiet turntable doesn't have that that, mm, that mm, kind mm. of you know that kind yeah. of interstation hiss you right, know right, right, right. and there's gra it's grainless mm -hmm. and it's funny I I mean I have a, a Lin right now it's got a cheap audio Technica AT, AV something 95, yeah, 95 right. and it's on the it's on a, 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 a an SME I think it's the m2-9 tone I put that same cheap cartridge on another turntable and it's much noisier. Mm. Just is. Mm. Mm. But I didn't, I wasn't, I was only buying that, mm. I only bought the LP12 because people harassed me. <laughs> I really just, I succumbed to peer pressure. Yeah, the whole anti direct drive right. mode that was happening in that time. And they were everywhere. They were legion, these right, people. Yeah. Everywhere you looked. And so I thought I'd try it. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing was that. I had a Pioneer turn, a Pioneer turntable. I had a Pioneer stereo receiver, SX1080, which nowadays is a big deal. People love those, that period, Pioneer. So anyway, I had this Pioneer stereo receiver. It was freaking heavy, man. That thing was really solidly built. And uh, I got it at JNR Music World in New York City, and I schlepped it home on the subway. You know, I put a cord around the box. <laughs> Actually, it, it was John from JNR, John from JNR. He tied the cord around the box, put a little handle on it, and I went down into the subway and took the R train back to Brooklyn. But anyway, so I had this Pioneer receiver, and my first separates were, because I got them at the same time, I got an AG511A preamp. It was like a really minimalist solid-state preamp, and a Van Alstein power amp, solid state Van Alstein power amp. I, you know, I bring it home and I hook it up and it just sounded, now they were both about the same power rating, the 
the Pioneer was either 100 watts a channel or 120 watts a channel, and so was the Van Olsen. So theoretically, they were equally powerful. Oh, and the speakers were these Freed speakers, I am Freed speakers. I love those. Largish bookshelf speakers. And uh, those are transmission line, by the way. And uh, they, they made great bass for a not very big speaker. But when I say great, I mean like fast and clean, really, you know, very pitchy. You could really hear pitch definition ex exceedingly well over those speakers. Anyway, so I put on the Van Alstine AGI combination. I wish I could tell you what the first record. It was probably a Talking Heads record if I come <laughs> transporting myself back to that time. But something of that type or The Clash. And it just was one of those, whoa, it is so much louder sounding. And I'm trying hmm. to play it at more or less the same level when I went from the Pioneer to the AGI Van Olsen combination. But it just had this release quality. It's kind of like the thing with the turntable, but it just sounded more... It's, the speaker sounded bigger. It just was more fun, you know. So anyway, I live with the AGI 511, uh, the AGI 511 and the Van Olsen combination. I let it sit there for a couple of days listening only to that and then I went back to the Pioneer and within like two seconds of going back to the Pioneer was like, nope, this is done. Wow. <laughs> and I sold it to one of my pals. Sequence is everything, yeah, you know, always tell me. done, yeah. At that time, I mean, I think you know, that era, 75 to 85, was an era when people were like, new, th you know, the audio world was presenting a lot of data about, you know, listening. It was the first time, I think, for right. once in a lifetime, where they said, you know, you can hear the difference. Right. And that was not before that. Well, that was a Harry Pearson thing. Right. right. I was definitely following Harry Pearson. And, I th and we were trying to learn how to listen during that yeah. era. I use mm -hmm. Harry to learn, you mm -hmm. know, as well. Mm -hmm. What are we looking for when we upgrade? That's the dumb question. What do you want? So, so Lynn was distributed by a company called Audiophile Systems for years and years and years. And... I'm not sure if it was Audiophile Systems or Lynn, but they introduced what they called, I don't know, it wasn't, they didn't call it an isolation platform, but that's kind of what it was. And it was a really light piece of wood. We have one somewhere. We have one here, and had these little set screws in it, and you could level the platform and put the turntable on top of it. Just a piece and of wood. Was, and it was not expensive. I mean, at the time, it might have been like $40 or something. What? Right. So anyway, I bought this thing home, and I was living in a, in a tall uh, concrete building on Broadway and 71st Street. And I had this problem with sometimes when big trucks would roll by on, mm. on Broadway that I could hear it through my speakers. It would like this rumbling sound, right? So um, I, take the, I take the turntable. Actually, no, what I did first was I put the turn. I put the platform on the floor, and I just put my ear to it and listened, like waiting, hopefully that a truck would roll by. Wow, right? that's an and interesting I thought. To this thing, and I thought, wow, I, I can hear it. I can hear it, but it's way less. Because then I like quickly like pulled it out and put my ear directly on the floor, and suddenly the floor, the rumble was louder through the floor than it was through this little. Platform. You didn't use a glass. No, uh, it's just ear contact. So anyway, that was that was a, an early tweak for me was to use that isolation platform with the with the Lin LP12. What did it do to your LP12? It it, separated again, from the rumble. It well beyond that, it just sounded cleaner. Right. It definitely sounded cleaner, and it was a very cheap tweak. You know. I still use it. So. Uh, I always put my Lin on. In fact, when I reviewed the fancy thirty thousand dollar Lin, mm -hmm. I put it on that same thing. Oh really? Wow. So. Uh, and I have some, uh, I'm not going to reveal the name of the company yet, but I, I did buy some uh, footers, you know, you know, metal and rubber uh, footers at Axpona from a manufacturer. And uh, I'm still, I, I don't want to come out and talk about it yet because I don't really do tweaks on, my, uh, on this show. But initial uh, impressions are positive, so I, I probably will talk about it soon. But anyway. That's, so anyway, people are using isolation feet or something. You know, it's funny. Remember when the, the Goldman feet came out, those, those tiptoe-looking things? But the, they were tiptoes made by, uh, that were distributed by, I think, 
Sumiko? Sumiko, yeah, Sumiko. They were just yeah, yeah. aluminum cones, maybe like two inches tall. Which are still popular. It's still just... popular. But those were not a terribly expensive. But then these Goldman cones that were some kind of steel and they were filled with um, some kind of cookie, rubbery stuff. And they were really expensive. They were then like maybe $250 for a set of three. You know what the DIY people were doing the exact period? No, no. Marbles. Marbles. Oh, I so the, the component would move a little yeah. like this. Yeah. Oh, I and did it, that. Actually, I thought it was a pretty good scheme, other oh, yeah, than yeah. that it was a little weird and everything was, wiggled yeah, around. Yeah, wiggled around. Oh, I was into the whole marble thing. But, um, yeah, so using those tiptoes and putting tiptoes under you know speakers, but also under electronics and stuff, was definitely uh, a thing. Absolutely. So Herb, here's the, here's where we go from here. Uh, so upgrades aren't just like tweaky things. I think a lot of times when people are talking about upgrading, what they really are saying is I want to get a new pair of speakers. That's the upgrade. Or I will need a new cartridge or turntable or something. Or a DAC. Right? But right. again, what is it that they want? What are they searching for? I don't think it's as simple as I wish it would be. Oh, okay. I think Actually, when people want things, mm -hmm. I know people who are compulsive shoppers. Right. Oh, I know I mean, someone really like compulsive that. shoppers. Yes, I know. I mean, they guy. can't stop themselves, <laughs> and it's like they spend more than they want to spend. Right. And it's it, it a they're powerless over that compulsion. Right. But b obviously, or at least I imagine, they're expecting to feel more safe and comfortable. And maybe more like they fit in the world better or they will be perceived in the world better. Heavy. And I really believe some of those kind of things, no, I mean, they apply to everybody. Okay. Children, adults, men, women. I, but I think those same things spin their way into the audio world. Okay. I mean, I know people who aren't even really into high-end hi-fi that if they see an amp and it looks cooler than their amp, they go, damn, I want this one, it looks cooler. Right. My, my point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of different emotional reasons for change. So it's not just sound? I, don't th I think sound might be down the list a little bit. Okay. And I think expectation-wise, this notion of sound being, it's all about getting some kind of perfect or better or even, you know, when I change speakers, I'm really, I do it all the time because of my job. I go from $35,000 to $800. And I have to ask myself, what did I just lose? Mm -hmm. And then I switch the other way, sequences everything. I mean, what did I get? You know, I hate to say it, but I, a lot of times going down, <laughs> it's like, well, that's why I remember it. I'm really kind of happy sometimes moving down on the food chain than up. And part of it is I'm more comfortable in that area. And I think audiophiles get caught up in the forums and the magazines, and they don't realize that there's a comfort zone that's kind of their personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe in upgrading to who you are. Well, I mean, I like this idea that sometimes it isn't sound, that sometimes it is because it just, there's something about a mystique. It, right, it looks it's fun. Cool. It's, it's, got, it's got some juice that your other thing doesn't have. You know, it's also the thrill of the new. <laughs> right, right, also right. Hard, right. And just change to change. So uh, the whole upgrading thing, it's hard to nail it down because I think everybody's approaching this for their own purposes and what their desires are at the moment they make the change. But right? change isn't a bad thing even if it's just for the hell of it. Even if it's a change for the worse other than the financial yeah. loss because you'll, you'll hopefully you'll learn something from making that mistake. So, but... Uh, I, I like it when people buy, upgrade to something three times as more expensive and they go, I better sell this quick and they go back to what they had. Oh, okay. That, uh, and always, I always get a kind of smile when that happens because right. It's got to feel good to go, okay, hey, I liked what I had. Uh, yeah, it's working on many, many levels. But I think the idea, I think sometimes people just put too much pressure on themselves that I'm going to make this thing and then everything's going to be wonderful. And then when it isn't, everything isn't suddenly wonderful. You say, oh, I really screwed up. I shouldn't have got this thing. 
because you're, you're putting that pressure on yourself. Well, the pressure also comes from your friends. I mean, even I. Wait, what do you fellas have friends? Steve comes over today, and the first thing I do is play the system, and I kind of want him to like it, you know? <laughs> I kind of want him to go, oh, shit, oh, that yes. sounds really good, Herbie. Right. You know, and I mean, I think I'm not alone like that. If I'm doing that, right. maybe everybody else is doing that, too. That's true. And I think sometimes we upgrade. It's part of a social thing, mm -hmm. you know? We're each doing upgrades, and then we go to each other's house, and we listen and I think that's really cool. I like the fact that people sort of, uh, I'm gonna change this thing and maybe, uh, I've even gotten into, I swear to God, like double blind things when somebody is playing, not like formal, but like you don't know what's playing. Mm, yeah, yeah. And it, but it's something new. Mm. And you kind of have to listen deep into the thing. And I think that's part of the fun is like, oh, you know, I'm going to do this and see if my friends notice the c different cartridge or whatever. Mm, yeah. I like that part. I think it's cool. I'm just saying, go easy on yourself. Yeah. That, that's my only point here. Man, I think that really is, if I do say so myself, the best advice of all is don't pin your hopes on the upgrade. It's of fixing everything or even fixing a little bit. Just, you know, see what happens. It's all part of the journey, you know. But I think we're going to change gears and I'm going to talk about an upgrade that I'm 1,000% sure you will enjoy. And you know what that is? Talking to her. <laughs> That's a good segue, right? Yes. Yeah. So you can, for a small fee, uh, speak to her every month. And you enjoy that. You've been doing I this do. for a I few really months like now, it. right? And, well, more than a few months. And it's funny. I mean, oh, I've been doing it for a couple, a year is now. It, oh, it's more. a year. More okay. than a year. Right, yeah. And... I look forward to it. The, the, the funny part is I learn more, I think, than the people I'm talking to. They think they're learning, but I see it. I mean, a lot of the ideas I get mm. for a story basically come from conversations. Mm. And they're, they're quiet, they're intimate, it's during the day usually, maybe it's at night. But it's, it's usually you're over there and I'm over here. It's like a culture jump. Uh, you know, I get exposed to your culture. Mm. For some reason, for a while, I was talking to a lot of people in Arkansas. And I have a really old friend in Arkansas. And it was just like a bonding. Well, it was kind of cool. It is. And yeah. that's why I like doing it. Yeah, me too. I love it. I really look forward to having, especially if they last for a while. I mean, sometimes people come and go, the, the people that talk to me. But sometimes there's some that I've talked to literally for over four years at this wow. point. Wow. So you become friends. You become intimate. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> it's not always about audio. A lot of times it isn't about audio at all. It's just about other stuff in their lives because I actually know these people now, which is nice. But Crime so, and misdemeanors. Yeah. And then I had this one guy in Japan, this Italian man <laughs> in Japan that I talk to every month. And he was fantastic. He was building a log, a log cabin of all things. Oh, I want to hear about oh, that. Oh, it was so cool. You Tell know, him to call send me. Send me I, pictures of it and ideas for it and everything. It was very, very cool. So here's how you can get in touch with her and uh, take it from there. I'm just making the introduction. Really simple. Really just simple. email me at Ishmael, I-S-H-M-A-E-L, uh, 39, like my age, uh, at earthlink.net. And it's earthlink.net. And we'll start the conversation on an email. Yeah, just like that. And, and it'll now, be fun. And now we're going to do what part, Herb? What comes next? The audiophiliac viewer system of the day. Yeah, rolls right off the tongue. No, that's my favorite part. I, <laughs> sometimes I get bored and I skip to that and then come back <laughs> to the middle again. That's it. Even in books, I do the same yeah, thing. Uh, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Okay, so here we go. Dayton System is a winner. He has a Pioneer PLX 1000 turntable, slightly modified, with an Ortofon M20 FL Super Moving Iron cartridge on an LP Gear Zubreme <laughs> head shell. There's another cartridge, an Audio Technica AT33 Mono Moving Coil cartridge. As for Phono Preamp, there's a Project 2 Box S2. Power amp, I mean the integrated amp, I should say, is a Willinson R300. For silver disc playback, there's an Oppo BDP83. It's fed into a Gashelli Labs J2 
AK4493 chip digital to analog converter. For streaming, Audio Lab 6000N. Now the speakers are real vintage. Those are all tech Lansing 846's Valencia on homemade stands based on Harbor Freight wooden dollies. Cabling is by Pine Tree Audio it's throughout the system. Thank you, Dayton. So we are back and uh, we want to thank you guys for watching. If you like you. what we're doing here on the channel, because Herb's going to be hopefully making more appearances, uh, please consider joining the Patreon. And of course, if you just like what we do here on the channel, hit the like button and please subscribe. And, uh, and that's it. So thank everybody for watching. So thank you for watching. And I really, really do hope to see you guys back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.